Good morning, everybody. I am Franca Fraternali. I am co-chair of this uh, session uh, tracks. In this first talk, we have the gene track uh, um, before the protein track. So we will have the first talk. That is uh, my pleasure to introduce Luca Catalani, and he will give a talk on uh, improved and NSGA2 algorithms for multi-objective biomarker discovery. Please, Luca. He is from the University of Eastern Finland. And while he puts his... Okay, perfect. So, Luca. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. So now we talk about uh, biomarkers, biomarkers from uh, omics data, biomarkers, so features uh, to detect conditions or to predict conditions about the patient. And uh, we are doing that uh, in a multi-objective manner. How should I point it? <laughs> okay. So uh, we are doing this, so biomarker discovery, by using machine learning because we wanted to use uh, to be able to use uh, more than one feature together because uh, we can, uh, by using more than one feature, we can have more information, do better prediction than by using just one feature. And because we want uh, to be able to train models and uh, to evaluate their performance on uh, the prediction that we want uh, to test. So uh, we are doing that with machine learning and we are doing that also in a multi-objective manner because uh, in the case of biomarkers, we want to have uh, accurate prediction, but we also would like uh, to have uh, as small uh, as a feature set as possible because a smaller feature set means uh, a less expensive test, so something that can be more easily used in practice. And uh, we, are, we are doing this uh, by using genetic algorithms because genetic algorithms have been proved uh, to be particularly effective for multi-objective problems. And uh, uh, especially there is one uh, genetic algorithm that's called NSGA2 that uh, has been particularly effective, and this, it is uh, the most widely used genetic algorithm, I think, uh, when uh, uh, you have a multi-objective problem. But uh, we know that uh, we uh, detected that it has some drawbacks when applied to biomarker discovery from omics data. And uh, we tried to improve it, so we are presenting here novel algorithms, to try to improve it and uh, have a better accuracy with uh, a smaller number of features. So what are these uh, drawbacks of the NSGA2? The uh, its drawbacks that we detected are mostly that uh, it has uh, uh, no policy to handle uh, uh, clone solutions, so solutions that are totally equal to each other. So in, our, in the population that is not always used, there, it can happen, and it often happens, that uh, there are many solutions that are totally equal, especially the smallest ones, so the one with less features. And uh, uh, th they can proliferate in, inside the population and uh, limit uh, the possibility to explore also other solutions. And also another drawback that we found is that since we are working with uh, very sparse solutions, so we have a lot of possible solutions because the features are a lot, but only a very, very small fraction of them uh, is uh, composed of good solutions. So uh, the domain is very sparse, and in particular, uh, there are difficulties in uh, removing redundant features. So you can have a biomarker that is uh, effective, has a good accuracy, but contains redundant features, so it is bigger than it is needed. And what we are doing uh, is uh, presenting uh, two new algorithms and uh, testing them against the uh, original NSJ2 and also against a simple algorithm that is uh, a lasso uh, that is uh, uh, trained using different penalizations so that it finds different, different trade-offs between accuracy and feature set size. And our improvements are in the fact that we introduce clone handling strategies and uh, on the fact that we introduce uh, uh, a different uh, kind of mutation and uh, different ways uh, to uh, give priority to the solutions in the selection process and in the tournament process. And uh, 
we uh, are also um, introducing uh, a way to give uh, uh, a greater importance to some uh, features, in our case, features are genes, with respect to others, uh, to give uh, a sort of warm start to the algorithm and to improve uh, the stability of the solutions that are found in uh, a keyfold cross-validation. This uh, is uh, a general uh, algorithm because uh, it is possible to generalize the original NSG2 to include the NSG2 and also our new algorithms. So, uh, what about the feature importance? Now we are talking about uh, features that in our use case are genes. And uh, um, we discovered that if we initialize our population with uh, just a uniform feature importance, so every feature can be selected with the same probability, we discovered that the algorithm is not stable from the point of view of the features that are selected in different folds. And we wanted to improve the stability, and in order to do that, we noticed that the lasso is more stable as an algorithm. So uh, our idea was to use the lasso to uh, uh, identify a feature importance from it and use it to initialize the initial population for the genetic algorithm so that uh, the stability could be improved. And uh, about the handling of the clones that can be inside the population, we introduced two different methods. One is the so-called clone indexing. That means that in the sorting, NSGA2 has a particular way to sort the solutions in order to give the priority to the better solutions, but also to solutions that are more different between themselves, so to cover all the front. And we introduced also another layer of sorting that takes into account the clones, so that the first copy is given a bigger priority than the other copies. And uh, also we introduced uh, a different uh, kind of mutation where uh, we give a bigger probability to remove features from the solutions rather than adding features. And in this way, we are able uh, to better detect uh, uh, features that are redundant, so to reduce the size of the biomarkers. And another strategy to handle the clones is to just, uh, let's say, repurpose them, so to remove the clones and to substitute them with uh, new individuals, new solutions. And these are the three algorithms, so the original NSGA2, where we just use the basic uh, uh, strategies, the NSG2CH, where we use uh, the strategy of the feature importance from LASSO and the strategy of the clone index, and NSG2CHS, where, where we use all the strategies. The datasets that uh, uh, we used uh, to validate uh, the new algorithms uh, are the TCGA, that is a dataset about breast cancer data. Uh, we, we are trying to predict uh, the, the subtypes of the breast cancer, and uh, the TCGA was used uh, for uh, doing a five-fold cross-validation and also in the external validation uh, as a training set. While we used the SCAN-B, that is another dataset about breast cancer, similar dataset, uh, but uh, totally different uh, with data collected from uh, uh, other laboratories, we used that uh, just for the testing phase of the external validation. These are some results from cross-validation. Uh, since we want to evaluate the biomarkers, so the feature sets, we need also what we can call an inner model, so a model that is trained of this, on these features to evaluate its performance. And uh, what, we can, uh, what we can say from the results is that uh, uh, the uh, lasso multi-objective, so the lasso used in a multi-objective way, uh, performs lower than the genetic algorithms, and that uh, our uh, new algorithms perform better than the original NSGA2. And uh, we can reach uh, with uh, around uh, five features, so five genes, a, uh, a balanced accuracy that is around 0.85. Then we measured uh, four uh, different uh, summary uh, scores. One score that is about the variety of the genes that are, uh, that are selected in the solutions. 
other two scores that are about the stability of the genes that are selected in different folds, and uh, another that is the test per volume, that is uh, uh, an overall score uh, with respect to the objectives that are uh, the, feature sets, the feature set size and accuracy, that is computed in our case on the test, just on the test set. And these are the results, and we can see that uh, the genetic algorithms perform better than the last multi-objective, and that uh, in most of the tests, uh, our novel algorithms perform better than the original NSGA2. This other plot is a summary plot uh, for the cross-validation, and also, in this case, we can see that uh, the uh, genetic algorithms perform better than the last multi-objective, and that uh, depending uh, on the size of the biomarkers that we consider, so on the number of features, we can have different inner models. We have tested the random forest, uh, the logistic regression, and the knife base. Different inner models are the best depending on the number of features that we want to use in our biomarker. Well, these are the results of the external validation. Also, in this case, we can see that the genetic algorithms perform better than the last multi-objective, and that, uh, in general, uh, our novel algorithms perform better than the NSGA2. And also, we can notice that the drop in accuracy from uh, uh, cross-validation inside the TCGA to external validation from TCGA to SCAN-B is not uh, a great uh, drop, uh, just uh, by 0.05, more or less. There should be another slide, okay. So, uh, this is one of the possible analyses that one can do, that is uh, taking into account the combination of main algorithm and inner algorithm. You can look at the genes that are most fr more frequently selected. In this case, we have the six genes that are most frequently selected by each algorithm. And uh, you can check in the literature what is uh, the expected uh, uh, importance of these genes in cancer, and you can also perhaps find uh, some uh, new relationships. So, in conclusion, genetic algorithms uh, work uh, quite well uh, in uh, uh, identifying new biomarker, uh, considering that as a multi-objective problem, so trying to identify all the interesting trade-offs uh, between uh, the accuracy and the set size. And uh, our novel algorithms perform better in most of the tests than uh, the NSG2 algorithm, especially when you consider biomarkers composed of, fi of five or more features. And uh, when we go from uh, a cross-validation to an external validation, the drop in accuracy is not uh, big, considering that uh, uh, we are uh, working with data that have been collected by different, uh, uh, stud a different study that is conducted in a different country. And, uh, well, about uh, future developments, we can consider that uh, it might be interesting to add also other objectives. Now we have two objectives, but it can be interesting to add also other objectives uh, uh, to the problem, uh, like, for example, objectives that are derived uh, by molecular networks, so trying to take into account the mechanistic uh, aspects of, uh, uh, of uh, what is happening, and also uh, we can uh, consider uh, uh, the prognostic value of the biomarkers, uh, for example, by taking into account the survival. Uh, the code uh, for this project is uh, freely available on GitHub, and uh, I have to thank uh, the Bioinformatics Research Group, that's led by Vittorio Fortino, this is also my co-author, and uh, uh, I have to thank also the supporters for uh, this project, that are the Academy of Finland and the uh, Atos Serco Foundation, Jane and Atos Serco Foundation, and uh, I thank you all for the attention. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Questions for Luca? Yes. Uh, so one quick question. Uh, when you have the genetic algorithm and you say you uh, basically you have multiple goals, essentially, right? 
do you combine this into the into the kind of the fitness function of the algorithm or is it some some different way to do that like a practical question yes th thanks for the question this is a very important aspect uh, in fact uh, we are doing that in a multi-objective manner meaning that uh, we uh, the output of the algorithm are all the good trade-offs between uh, the accuracy and the test size so uh, all the so-called non-dominated solutions are uh, uh, given as output. Other question? If so, so the, the number of features uh, that you find is uh, a theoretical optimum in your um, in your in your model. Would that also be optimal for translating that into the clinic where you would maybe have more, like to have a lot of robustness uh, when you test patients? Well, probably yes, because we did also external validation. So we uh, trained uh, the model on a data set that was collected uh, like in, in a place and uh, we tested it on another data set that was collected in another place. So this should work uh, also well in practice, I expect. Thank you. I have a question. Do you hear me? Ah, yes. I have a question um, about the clone that you remove. So how do you decide which to remove or do you remove them and, and substitute it with other information? Yes, this is a very good question because uh, in fact uh, it, it, it is quite crucial. Um, uh, with clones we mean uh, solutions that are totally equal, so uh, uh, they are the same set of features. Uh, so they, they can be considered totally inter interchangeable and uh, you can remove one or the other and, and it is the same. Uh, just the important thing is uh, to take one of, uh, keep one of them and removing the others. Um, how we do that is that uh, is, uh, with two strategies. The, the uh, most basic one is just uh, to keep one of them uh, and uh, give uh, a lower priority to the others so that uh, during the selection process they will, uh, perhaps not immediately, but sooner or later they will be not selected. Um, while the other strategy uh, that is like a more aggressive one is uh, to just remove uh, the clones and substitute them with new individuals. Clearly when you substitute them with new individuals, these individuals can be uh, not particularly uh, optimal. But uh, uh, we have noticed that in some cases you, you also gain some performance in this way. You add information that was not taken in, in account before. Yes, it, it is possible to uh, include information uh, that can be also useful uh, to form more interesting biomarkers in the future. Yes, you're right. Thank you very much. And uh, we thank Luca for, for his talk and this presentation. Thank you. Proceeding talk for, we go back to proteins. So proceeding talks for the protein track. And this is Jaron Geffen from Barilan University. And this, he will talk about a, a software, distilled prot BERT, a pro, actually a language model, a distilled product language model to distinguish between real protein and the randomly shuffled counterpart. Thank you. Yarun yeah, for Can you coming. hear me? Hello, uh, everyone. So I will talk about our model, the still Podbird model, which is a, a, a protein language uh, uh, model. Uh, okay, so as I look at it at our uh, project, we have two main uh, uh, concepts. One is the uh, the uh, algorithmic part, which, which is the uh, optimization of uh, a BERT model for uh, proteins. And the other one is the uh, biological part, uh, which uh, we try to uh, use our uh, model to uh, uh, distinguish real uh, sequences from their Kalet shuffled uh, counterparts. And I will also talk about our future uh, uh, research. 
So the general uh, concept of this uh, project, uh, first of all, BERT uh, was uh, introduced to the world by uh, uh, Google in, the, in, uh, in uh, uh, 2018. Uh, and uh, uh, and the uh, new task that they were using for the pre-training uh, uh, was the uh, MLM, the mask language uh, uh, modeling, which is uh, basically the uh, idea you give the model the uh, sentence like Michael Musk home and you ask the model to uh, predict what is the uh, missing word uh, so uh, so uh, when would uh, be good uh, 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 prediction uh, and what it what it does is you train the model to uh, represent all the words and the sentence and then you uh, use the uh, representation of the words for uh, other tasks like uh, part of uh, a speech uh, and then there was the the group from uh, uh, from uh, uh, Bukhard Rust which uh, thought about to take this model and to use it for uh, uh, proteins, which you take the uh, sequence, mask some of the amino acids, and ask the model to uh, uh, predict what is the uh, missing one. So it might be K, R, or any other one. But the problem with these models is that their size is very, very big. So what we did is we tried to uh, optimize this size by using the knowledge uh, uh, distillation uh, uh, method. So what you do here is you take a smaller uh, uh, model from the teacher, which is a uh, uh, Prodbert, uh, and you try to train it on the uh, MLM task. And you also, the loss, uh, if you can see here, so it, it uh, also gets the uh, label, which, is, which are the mask token that you need to uh, uh, predict. But you also try to make your weights and the uh, teacher weights look the uh, same. So you will get the, uh, the uh, knowledge from the teacher uh, model. Uh, so the first uh, a component is the cross uh, 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 entropy loss. What it does, it takes the uh, logic from the teacher and the student and try to make them and, and, and try to uh, reduce the gap. So the student weight will be, uh, will be will uh, look like the uh, teacher weight. And also you have the uh, cosine loss, which tries to uh, align the uh, weights of the students and the uh, teacher. And uh, in uh, that way, you, you get model which is much smaller than the teacher one, but can get, uh, I will talk about it, to the result uh, almost like the uh, teacher. So we were able to have the number of the parameters, uh, also known as the weight, also the, the model size on the uh, memory, and the number of uh, hidden uh, 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 layers. And we were also able to use much less uh, uh, hardware for the pre-training. Uh, and uh, a much less uh, uh, data for the pre-training. Uh, uh, and for the benchmark tasks, so we had uh, already the uh, results for uh, a podbird for the secondary uh, structure, which is CASP-12, TS-115, and CB-513. And we were able to get pretty close to, uh, to podbird. Uh, but we are half the size and uh, the training time was uh, also halved. And for the uh, localization, we were also, be, we were also uh, able to get pretty close to uh, Prodbert. 
uh, with half of the size, which is pretty nice. And uh, when you look at these two uh, sequences, can you uh, tell me which one is Will and uh, which one is the shuffle one? So I can't, and I guess that uh, if you don't read uh, sequences for your fun, so you also can't. Uh, so what we try to do is to check if our uh, uh, model can do that uh, uh, task and to tell us which one is the real uh, one and uh, uh, which one is the uh, shuffle one, the k shuffle one. So to make it even harder, we kept the uh, triplet, the singlet and the doublet uh, as the same as in the uh, real one when we shuffle them. So if you look, uh, KKT is twice in uh, sequence A and also in B. So uh, this, uh, 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 this was done to make it even harder for the uh, model to uh, distinguish the two uh, uh, sequences. Uh, uh, so the data set was the human uh, uh, proteome. Uh, we filtered it by uh, uh, length. We shuffled, as I told you, for the single, the doublet and the uh, triplet one. Uh, and we also kept the data set to be non-redundant. Uh, uh, if you can see, the number of the triplet one is uh, pretty much less than the singlet and the uh, doublet. That is uh, uh, because it is very hard to shuffle and to keep the number of uh, uh, klets uh, when you shuffle for the triplet or the fourlet. So uh, this is why this happened. Uh, so for shuffling, we use the U uh, shuffle uh, algorithm. Uh, for the redundancy, we use the uh, CD heat, uh, which I guess that you all know. And uh, we also uh, split the uh, data into train and test set uh, and uh, did the uh, cross uh, 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 validation. Uh, so the classification fault was the uh, extracting of the uh, representation from our uh, uh, model. Uh, then we move on to uh, pooling on the, uh, on the uh, representation because they were uh, very large and we want our uh, classifier to be pretty small, so we max pool. Uh, then we set the batch size, the uh, uh, optimizer, the uh, dropout, uh, and we uh, classify all the uh, data set with the simple uh, fit for neural uh, uh, network. Uh, and the result, as you can see, the uh, LSTM, which is pretty much the basic uh, uh, model now, reach for the signal to 0 0.7 AUC, which is pretty good, but not quite. And then there's a, a pretty huge leap uh, uh, using our model and uh, a prodbird with minor uh, uh, differences. Uh, but, but, uh, but our model is, as I said, is half of the size of the uh, prodbird. So it's pretty nice, even that you can uh, distinguish the real one from the shuffled ones, uh, with the, even for the uh, triplet. So it was quite good. And uh, I know that you all uh, uh, thought about it. So the real one is uh, sequence A, which is a zinc finger uh, 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 protein. And the triplet uh, a shuffled one is B. And the model could, uh, could uh, uh, also tell us which one is the real and uh, which one is the uh, shuffled one. And uh, if you think about the future uh, research that we might look uh, uh, into, so uh, there are also two parts for this uh, for this concept, so the, f the first one is the, uh, the uh, algorithmic part, uh, which you might get even smaller than half of the size. So uh, a tiny bird was, I think, four uh, uh, layers, while bird is uh, uh, 34, which is quite nice. So we might try this on the uh, proteins. 
uh, the biological side is we might take the shuffled ones that our model said that, that, that they are real ones and try to uh, synthesize them and to see if they form some kind of uh, uh, a protein. And we might take our task and uh, take not the shuffled one, but any uh, 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 a different group of uh, uh, sequences and uh, try to uh, distinguish them from the, uh, from the uh, real ones. And I would like to thank uh, go, uh, uh, Professor uh, Goldberg for his help, uh, the DSI for the computing uh, uh, resources, the uh, ISCB for this whole uh, uh, event and uh, members from my uh, lab. Uh, and you can access the uh, model. Uh, 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 anyone can uh, use it. It is uh, pretty uh, simple. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, question. I, I said that you, try, you used the presentation that was the output of the built architecture for the downstream application, and it's very typical to do fine tuning. Did you try to fine tune the parameters of the built architecture for the downstream task? So, if I, go, I can go back, or can you put the presentation? Oh, thanks. Okay. So for the secondary structure and the uh, localization, what we did is to fine tune the uh, model, uh, which worked pretty good. But for the shuffle versus uh, a real one, we uh, used the uh, feed forwards. So we used it as a feature uh, uh, extractor. Uh, but yeah, but the fine tuning worked great, and in uh, half of the time of uh, Podbird. Thank you. Question. Last one, because we need. Have you checked uh, which window size uh, give you a better prediction? Which window size what? For shuffling, which window size uh, K shuffling? Oh yes. Yeah. So uh, as you can see from the uh, results. So the singlet was the was the best one, uh, and the doublet and the triple was uh, uh, pretty much worse, but uh, not quite because it is also good to get uh, uh, 0 0.9. Uh, and we didn't try the fourlet or the fivelet, but uh, but it might work. Okay, thank you, Dan. Yeah. So we. We can move now to the highlight talk of the protein session. Uh, so this is Michael Tress from the CNIO in, in, uh, in Madrid. And this is, uh, uh, his talk will be on the clinical importance of tandem exon duplication derived substitution. Michael. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me again. Um, yesterday I, I gave a talk in which I showed um, that uh, the vast majority of coding genes have a single main isoform. Um, but even though this is the one message about alternative splicing that you really all need to take home, um, there are um, quite a number of genes that have important alternative isoforms. And so that's what I'm going to try and talk about um, today. One particular class of these are alternative splicing variants. Sorry, um, well, I'll, I'll point it a bit more to me. Is that better? Right, it was pointed up in the air. Right, um, so um, uh, explaining these, uh, the, the, what, what is a tandem duplicated exon event. So um, um, what, hap what basically happened somewhere back in evolution is that a single exon or, or, or a couple of exons within uh, a gene duplicates and then um, it becomes incorporated into the gene model. Not only, there's a lot of tandem duplications that occur within genes, most of the time these tandem duplications 
end up being incorporated into the main isoform of that particular gene. So if you imagine uh, titan, for example, that's full of duplications. What happens in this particular case is that one of the duplicated exons is, um, is uh, expressed in, in, in one transcript and the other exon is expressed in the other transcript. And since they're duplicated, obviously, with time, um, one of the exons ends up uh, moving uh, away. The sequence is, is no longer exactly the same. So what you end up with is, is two homologous exons which produce um, two hom distinct homologous protein regions within a... Um, within, within the, the two isoforms that are generated from the transcripts. It's important to note here that I'm calling these um, homologous protein regions UHP regions. Okay, I'll mention that a bit later on. That's because um, it, it's really a mouthful to, to give them any other name. And then obviously these two, particular, these two homologous sequences then generate two very similar proteins. You can see, uh, you can see them here. It's the, um, this is the same protein and uh, the orange bits and the purple bits are the homologous regions here. So, um, on our definition of uh, tandem um, duplicated exons, they can occur in any part of the sequence. So you can have them uh, mutually exclusively spliced in internally. Um, they can um, work as uh, alternative promoters. Um, 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 so you get two different five prime CDSs, or you can get two different five, uh, three prime CDSs. Um, and, and curiously, uh, slight, or more or less half of the set that we found that we curated um, um, over the six years that we took us to do this are mutually exclusively spliced exons, so they're internal. And so even, but even though most of these um, tandem um, exon duplicated substitutions are internal, they're at the, the ones at the, the, the five prime and three prime ends are actually a lot more uh, common than you would expect them to be. So these are, these are actually enriched in the, in, the, in, the, in the terminal regions. And, and just to mention that there's, there's, there's a whole set of genes that we left out, a whole set of splice isoforms that we left out. For example, the proteocadarins have got a huge number of these, um, of these homologous exons, uh, five prime exons, um, but we don't include them in our set because they're actually defined as separate genes for some strange reason. Right. Um, how does this re uh, relate to mutually exclusive splicing? Because it is actually related and it's important to, to, to make this definition because there have been papers on mutually exclusive splicing. So this is the typical uh, example of mutually exclusive splicing. This is DSCAM with, a, with a huge numbers of uh, differently spliced exons that are internal within the sequence. Um, and only in what happens in this case is that only a single exon is chosen in each one of the different transcripts that can be produced. This produces a whole different series of, of structures. You can see this is very nice. They've actually resolved these structures for one of the sets. Um, this uh, type of alternative splicing um, that's mutually exclusive, that involves multiple exons, is very common to Drosophila. It really doesn't happen in the human genome except with these two genes that have three exons each in the middle of, um, in, 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 in between um, two exons that are internal. The difference between them is that the gene SLC12A1 has three exons that have evolved by tandem duplication. The exons in, CACNA, in CACNB has three exons that were obviously not related. They evolved by some other means. They're, they're completely different sizes. Um, and so uh, what we're looking at in, in, is these is the ones here that have evolved by homologous. Um, they're evolved by, by tandem duplication. And we're not interested in these particular um, types of mutual exclusive splicing. So we have mutual exclusive splicing that involves exons that uh, are not homologous. And also there's a definition of mutual exclusive splicing that says that mutually exclusively spliced exons can only be internal, um, so that would exclude the tandem duplicated regions that we have in the five prime and three prime CDS. So this is tropomyosin that you're looking at here, and it's got four of them. Um, and also, again, looking at tropomyosin one, it also excludes those cases where um, there is a transcript that includes 
both exons. So there's here, there's one particular transcript that includes both exons. So TPM1 is not in this particular splice, uh, this particular exons of TPM1 are officially not mutually exclusively spliced. And we, we did include those. So we generated this set of 236 um, events. And there were um, several previous studies that were done um, on looking at mutually exclusively spliced exons, homologous exons, and they're not quite the same as what we found. So this, this is how we overlapped with these pre th three previous sets. Uh, Kondrashev and Kunin did this first in, in 2001, and we found most of the ones that they found. There's three we couldn't find for some reason. Um, and the biggest difference we had was with the Hatchi et al. Uh, paper uh, on the landscape of mutually exclusive exon splicing, where they looked at internal mutually exclusively, exclusively spliced exons. Um, so what do we find in the set? So the, the set itself has um, uh, either, you can, you can find exons where they're very, very similar. Um, you even find cases where there's a one, just one residue difference, or you can find cases that are completely different. There's hardly any obvious homology here at all. However, in, this, in Nectin 2, there's a transmembrane helix, and there's this motif at the end here, which is really important. And both of these are conserved, and so this is uh, homologous. Um, so we count it in our set. And when we actually look at the, um, the conservation of, of the residues between the two UHP regions that we're looking at, so, you know, the regions in, 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 in brown here, uh, we, f we find that um, we can actually, we can actually separate them into regions that bind ligands, uh, regions that have a globular structure predicted by alpha fold, and then regions that, have, that are disordered predicted by alpha fold. And this more or less fits with what you would expect. The regions that are predicted as disordered by alpha fold, um, the vast majority of the, uh, of the alignments are either with gaps or, or the, the amino acid residue changes, whereas when you're actually looking at something with a globular structure, there's uh, a lot more conservation of the, um, of the uh, amino acid. And when you actually look at the, the ligand binding residues, almost 80% of them are conserved. The ligand binding residues tend to be conserved because they're functionally important for that particular region. Here's a couple of cases. Um, RAB37, uh, what I've done here is painted on the surface of the protein those residues that change and those residues that are conserved, the conserved residues in red, the yellow residues have changed, and this looks like this might have a different um, surface interaction uh, patch for another binding to another protein. This is the SLC12A1 case we saw uh, earlier on. These three different isoforms are expressed in different parts of the kidney, and they have different ion affinities. So how do these tandem duplicated exons event suffer, uh, differ from all of the alternatively spliced exons? First of all, their age. They're a lot more conserved. Um, for some strange reason, when we did this figure in the paper, uh, we split the, um, the, uh, tandem, the OHP region, the tandem duplicated exons into three different groups, depending on where they were in the sequence, but they're all highly conserved. Um, and they're all highly conserved in other fish species. And what we actually did here was we uh, carried out blast um, uh, against five fish species. We uh, manually annotated all, all, all the results and this is what we ended up with. So there was something like 80% of the um, tandem duplicated exons that we found were conserved in fish. Compare this to the other different splice events that you're seeing down here. You probably can't read them, but these are, this is how, conserv how conserved in fish the insertions were. This is mutually exclusively spliced exons that are not homologous, and these are, uh, are N-terminal regions. They're much, much less conservation in, um, in, in fish than, uh, than, than, the one, than, than our splice variants. Um, and in fact, when we actually looked in detail at where we found the, the, the last common um, ancestor, um, what we found was that, um, that um, something like more than two thirds of them, almost two thirds of them, sorry, um, were actually conserved uh, in the last common ancestor of vertebrates, which is uh, more than 500 million years ago. And even 21 cases, we actually found um, uh, homology with, uh, uh, with some bilaterian species. So, how else do they differ? The expression of the protein level is completely different. Um, 
we're looking again that we split them into again into different uh, splice types this time all the uh, tandem duplicated exons are um, in the same column we found evidence for something for, for more than 30 percent of them and very little evidence at all in proteomics experiments for the other different types of splice events and one thing that um, we, we noticed as well was that the ones that the, 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 the cases that we found the vast majority of them were tissue specific and it's very difficult to see tissue specific specificity in these type of proteomics experiments um, and so finding 70 percent of tissue specificity for uh, for these events is is, is quite um, remarkable and finally clinical relevance what we did here was with, that we uh, mapped pathogenic variants from ClinVar um, to um, to, uh, alter to the main exon in each gene, and we did it for uh, for for for, um, uh, for for those event for those cases where we where we did where we did the analysis of the conservation previously. So just in these cases, we did it. So just for these exons, and um, first of all, we mapped all pathogenic variants to um, a single isoform within. Um, the uh, within each gene and then anything that any pathogenic variant that didn't map to this single isoform um, was counted as a pathogenic variant that mapped to an alternative exon and we saw how many of these uh, um, uh, alternative exons that had pathogenic um, variants uh, involved uh, tandem duplicated exons and we found just 35 uh, pathogenic variants in alternative exons, which is very low. But of these 35 um, uh, sets of pathogenic variants in, in exons, 15 of them were in um, tandem duplicated exon substitutions. And even though there's such a huge, such a tiny, tiny number of pathogenic variants, this was still highly significant. So um, there are I think almost 29 times as frequent pathogenic variants in, um, in tandem duplicated exons as they are in any other type of splice variant. So we've annotated this set of um, 236 uh, tandem duplicated exon substitutions. They're available. Um, the tandem duplicated exon substitutions are, are very rare. There's only about, they only occur in about 1% of genes. They're highly important though. Um, because we find that more than 90% of them arose from a, a common ancestor that predated the separation between uh, tetrapods and, and fish. That's more than 450 million year, 15 million years ago. We detect 20 times as much uh, evidence for these events in proteomics experiments as we do with all other splice events. And um, they're highly enriched in pathogenic variants, as I've shown already. And we've done some extra work on this, um, which is uh, we found fairly, fairly interesting. Um, what we did was we we already done this for the human set, so now we actually an tried to annotate tandem exon duplications in Drosophila. We did this in a in a in, in a vertebrate species, basically because uh, we know that these things are, con are conserved all the way across vertebrates, so it's not so interesting looking at other vertebrates. Um, within Drosophila. Um, um, we found that approximately 1% of the Drosophila genes had um, these uh, exon types. And of the 236, sorry, 236 events in the human set that we looked at, 54 of them have Drosophila orthologs that also have these events. So you've got 1% in 1% of the human genes have these events, 1% of the Drosophila genes have these events, yet 54 of the overlapping um, events, uh, genes have events in Drosophila as well, which is obviously uh, highly uh, significant and it, and it really suggests that there's clear evidence of convergent evolution. Here there's three examples, uh, ABCC, you can see um, the, uh, this is actually not just, not just Drosophila but also C. elegans as well, so the um, uh, C. elegans and Drosophila and human um, tandem exon substitution events are painted on the structure. You can see they're in different places. KCNMA as well, three different colours. You can see again. And this is tropomyosin, which is absolutely incredible because the whole of tropomyosin, apart from, I think, this exon, 
has is either uh, has either a tandem ex exon duplication event in human Drosophila or uh, C. elegans, and in fact, in, in, in many cases, it has it has two separate uh, duplication events. And the other thing that we found was that, 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 that uh, there was a lot of evidence for, for tissue specificity. Um, and that these, um, be, and, and uh, in, in the functional terms for these uh, events, so you can see them here. Um, uh, tissue specificity in, in brain, in not just in human, but also in, in Drosophila as well, in, uh, in muscle, um, in red, you can see that disc, and, and, and human and Drosophila, and in particular in ion channels. And this is um, the gene, uh, human genes, um, that involve uh, uh, voltage-gated calcium channels. And all, again, all these different colors uh, come from different uh, um, tandem duplicated exon substitutions in different genes across Drosophila and, and human. You can see that more or less a third of the, this huge protein uh, has these type of splice events in human or, or Drosophila. So what this result seems to be showing is that um, um, that first of all, that the, the, the proteomics and uh, um, that sorry, what these results seem to be showing is that the, the that maybe these uh, these events are in, have some sort of role in the evolution of metazoan organs because um, first of all, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that these things are highly tissue specific. Um, the vast majority of tandem duplicated exons events are, are ancient in in all species. And there's a lot of evidence for convergent evolution of the tandem duplicated exon events across the species. And oops, and that's the talk. Thank you very much to the, the authors that you can see there: Laura, Fernanda, Tomas, and Fernando and, Fe, and Federico. And um, we have a poster as well, which uh, you can look at today if you want to ask about that. Thank you. Question. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I have a question. Uh, have you seen a uh, difference in secondary structure of these elements? For example, if it's overrepresented as helixes mm. in most other cases? Yeah, actually, yes. Um, <laughs> that's the, the one thing I didn't show in, in this particular case. It's we haven't necessarily really seen any any um, overrepresentation of, 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 of one particular type or, or other, but what we do see is that he, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference, there's, there's a difference in, in the distribution of, of helices. So if I remember rightly, um, the, the, the helices, the, the internal helices are um, yeah, so oof. Yeah, you've definitely this got would me. It would be very nice to see this result because yeah. uh, I think the helixes so, should be uh, overrepresented well, the because the, of the, the helices, the, transmembrane the, the, domains, as I uh, said. Right. So. right, yeah, I mean, there certainly will be. But, the, but what we found was that the, 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 the terminal regions, the ones in the, the three prime CDS and the five prime CDS that have. Um, these uh, regions tend to be um, a lot more uh, exposed to solvent, and, and it's this, and, and it's generally the helices, it's the helix residues that tend to be a lot more exposed to solvent. So these are things like signal, coil coil regions, coil coil, coil regions, transmembrane helices, uh, signal peptides. All these things seem to be um, enriched within these. Kind of duplicated as, as a building blocks, as a building blocks in this. It's almost like something you can change, which really doesn't affect too much the function somehow. But it... Hi, uh, thank you for the talk, and it's very intriguing. So, if I understand correctly, the, the idea is that this was somehow mechanism that was very popular or acceptable in early evolution. Yeah. And once structure have become more, I don't know, rigid or I don't. There is something that reject this kind of operations, right? Because duplication could have occurred later, but it's, yeah. and then on top of it, you showed that in brain, and I guess this is you know modern uh, fine tuning, mm -hmm. you see them again. So it's yeah, I, it, I, I mean the, the more than ninety percent of them are highly conserved, and and that's really quite surprising because because there's, there's very few recent recently evolved cases. 
um, that, are, that have been incorporated. There are some, for sure, but, um, but, the, but the, there aren't very many. That if, uh, is, is for us, is really quite uh, remarkable, and, and I think it does probably have to do somehow with the, the evolution of, of different organs. And like I said, it seems to have affected brain, heart, muscle. There's, there's the, a lot of enrichment, enrichment there. More. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I was curious, um, is your comparison set of alternative exons yeah. derived from the set of like primary transcripts you were talking about in your talk yesterday? So are we just taking anything that's not in that primary set of transcripts? Or? No, no. Yeah, I mean, you, it's a good question. Uh, but um, uh, so, so what we the, so the set obviously I didn't really have time to explain that but the um, the, the set of exons that we looked at there were there were, were 10,605 events this is more or less the set we made the comparison between these tandem duplicated exons and the other other exons first of all they had to have at least um, 14 amino acids because we had to be able to detect, detect them in blast they couldn't just like in the, the the talk yesterday they couldn't overlap with any other exon um, but they. But they didn't have to be in uh, alternative from 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 the from the principal exon. Um, what you had to have was two distinct transcripts with distinct exons, and both of them had to be conserved because we didn't automatically assume that the, that the main exon uh, was conserved as well. Because it, obviously, if you select one particular transcript and then say everything else is alternative, you may have selected the transcript that's not conserved. And, and in which case, so, so you, in every single case, we 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 evaluated the alternative and the and the reference exon. We can. So, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a last question. Sure. Are you planning to map the GNOMAD variants to this? Because you should see the opposite. Effect. Yeah, so you're talking about human genetic yes. uh, variation. Um, uh, we should, and we haven't. And we should effect. do it, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, no, absolutely. You should see the same effect, and we haven't done it. Okay. So I, I can't tell you, okay. but, but you should see the same effect, yeah. Okay. If there are no more questions, we thank uh, Mike and all the speakers of the day.